Good morning. My name is Steve. I am uh, one of the elder candidates here at New Life, and uh, I want to add my welcome to all the visitors that are here this morning, and uh, also like to, uh, of course, welcome all of our home folks. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, this, um, this beautiful Lord's Day, thank you. This morning, we'll uh, continue in our study of, of James. Uh, we'll be focusing on, again in chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. So if you'll uh, start finding James, and while you're turning there, um, I, I, can't, I can't not thank you for... Uh, allowing me this opportunity. Um, a church family like this I've, I've never had before. Um, my, uh, my heart is full as I step up here this morning. Um, folks, I'm going to tell you, there's, there's not a whole lot of churches where before I could even get up here, I've had two guys stop and pray over me before I get up here. And... Uh, that just uh, that, that makes my heart joyous. I thank you for your confidence in me. I thank you for your support. Um, I thank you for the opportunity over the last couple of years now during this candidacy process that uh, I have had a chance to really get to know our elders here so much better through reading and reading and reading and reading and reading. Right, Alan? My head sometimes wants to explode, and um, I, I have to, I, I sit at home a lot of times wondering, how does Kyle keep up with all this? Because I know he's got more than than, than I read, and uh, I just I'll just blame it on my old mind. He has a younger mind, so <clears throat> uh, I thank you for uh, for allowing me to uh, get to know my elder brothers, <laughs> even though they are half my age. But I do do thank you for that. Um, this uh, this letter written by James. The half brother of Christ uh, can have rich meaning for us as we are reminded to put faith in action. It's easy to say we have faith, but true faith will produce loving actions toward others, being a doer of the word and not a hearer only. If you're able, would you uh, please stand as we read God's word? Again, we're in James 1, beginning in verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I've heard it said that good teachers provide information people do not already have for. If they already knew it, they wouldn't need the information. I say that because those of you that attended home group 
on Wednesday night have already looked at this passage. So it's my job, my duty this morning to try to expound on what you may have learned Wednesday night. But this job is made much more difficult by the men we're blessed with as home group leaders and teachers. But my, my desire is that after our time together this morning, we can all see how this passage in James glorifies Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we have together this morning. God, you are the God of mercy, the God of grace, the God of strength. And I pray, Father, that as we look at this passage this morning on how trials and temptations come in our lives and how we should handle those trials and temptations. I pray, Father, that this congregation this morning sees nothing but Your Word and Your Son. I pray, Father, that just as the Israelites were instructed to remove all leaven from their house during Passover, every morsel, I pray, Father, that You remove every morsel of me in this sermon and that nothing comes through except Your truth. Father, these things we ask in the most holy name of Christ. Amen. So, how important is it for Christians to trust God? It's so important, James writes, that we should call our worst moments joyful because trials help us trust God more. People who trust God ask Him for wisdom and then take what He gives. People who trust God make a bigger deal about their rewards in the next life rather than their wealth in this one. People who trust God don't blame Him for their desire to sin. They give Him credit for all that is good in their lives. They look into His Word and they act on what they see. I wish I had written that, but I didn't. That comes from a commentary at a uh, website called BibleRef.com. But I pray that we look at that last sentence this morning that says they look into His Word and they act on what they see there. I pray that as we go through this passage this morning that you look deeply into the words of that were the words of James. But more importantly, that when we leave, that we act on what we hear this morning. Not just listen, but be doers of the Word. So as we begin to look at these verses, it's important to note that you will see the word trial used in verse 12. And then the word temptation is used in verse 13. The reason for this is that even though these words are obviously different in our English language, they come from the same root word in the original Greek. I apologize, I'm not a Greek scholar, nor do I really have any business jumping into this, uh, but I think it's important, so we're going to give it a go. Um, I practiced all week on this Greek word. So uh, the Greek word parasmo. Is that good? Parasmo. Can mean trial or temptation. Can mean either. The meaning of parasmo is rooted in the Old Testament, where several Hebrew words speak of difficult situations that are experienced by those chosen by God as a test intended to demonstrate the quality of an individual's faith 
or to purify their character. Obviously, these two words have different meanings to us. A trial is something we experience not necessarily by choice, but a temptation is something that we do have a choice in. So whether we experience a trial or a temptation, we must remember that if we persevere, the struggle will contribute greatly to the development of our spiritual maturity. This happens the same with our muscles in our body. I'm again speaking without much knowledge of this, just as I did with the Greek, because you may not know that I'm allergic to working out and gyms and such. Uh, when I'm around exercise, I, I break out in a sweat, I get tired, I get sore, and I get really grumpy. Um, so I, I don't think personally it's a good thing for me. However, my wife does not share that same idea. Um, but in talking with some of you that participate in this form of, and I was trying to come up with a good word here, and I came up with penance, because I think that's what exercise is, is penance. Uh, I have learned that as you exercise, muscle tissue is actually broken down. It's broken down and it's stretched. So it, it doesn't return to, to its normal original size as long as the exercise is continued. The same thing happens with trials and temptations. As long as we persist in our pursuit of a godly life, we may be broken and stretched, but our faith will continue to grow. So let's see how this happens. Let's look at verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. In verse 2 that Alan preached on last week, we're told to count the trials we encounter as joyful. Joyful. Why? Because our faith only grows stronger when tested by trials. Trusting God through our trials produces steadfastness. Steadfastness is more Christ-like maturity where we trust Him more and with more resolve the choice to keep trusting God in the midst of the trial brings His blessing. Our circumstances may be hard, but God is on the side of those who trust Him through life's most difficult moments. Our reward for our dedication is the crown of life. Not an award like is given to a winning athlete, not a wreath, not a medal, not a trophy, nor the glory or honor here on earth, but the ultimate reward that we receive is eternal life that is given to those faithful Christians who persevere through trials and temptations in this life. Both Paul and Peter write about crowns that are given to the faithful. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27 says, Do you know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And Peter says in 1 Peter 5 verse 4, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So James says in verse 12, 
He's, he makes the connection between our love for God and our ability to remain faithful to Him in hard times. Those who truly love God trust Him, and those who truly trust Him continue to obey even when life gets hard. Let's look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and He Himself tempts no one. So where does temptation come from? Temptation develops from an evil desire inside us, not from God. It begins with an evil thought and becomes sin when we dwell on that thought and allow it to become an action. Like a snowball rolling downhill, sin grows more destructive the more we let it have its way. The best time to stop a temptation is before it's too strong or moving too fast to control. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability but the temptation He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. People who live for God often wonder why they still have temptations. Does God tempt us? God tests people, but He does not tempt. God does not tempt us by trying to seduce us into sin. God does allow Satan to tempt people, but he does this in order to refine our faith and to help us grow in our dependence on Christ. We can resist the temptation to sin by turning to God for strength and choosing to obey His Word. In His Word, there are lots of examples of God testing his saints. Abraham in Genesis 22. Abraham, when God required him to sacrifice his son Isaac. Israel in Exodus, specifically in Exodus 16 4, where it says, The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And then, of course, Job. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright. One who feared God and turned away from evil. Then beginning a few verses later, God allows Satan to test Job. When I consider the testing and the trials of these great men of God, I think, who am I to question why I am being tempted? Why am I experiencing these trials? How can I ask the question when God ordained so many in the Bible with much greater faith than I to experience his trials. The ESV study Bible says that God tests us so that our character is strengthened, but he never tempts or lures people into sin. Since God cannot be tempted with evil, he is unreservedly good. He would never entice human beings to sin or seek to harm their faith. God brings trials in order to strengthen the Christian's faith. He never tempts, however, because He never desires His people to sin. Christians should never blame God when they do wrong. It's easy to blame others and make excuses for evil thoughts and wrong actions. We talked a little bit about this in Sunday school this morning when uh, the Israelites changed their mind about leaving and going back. They wanted to go back to Egypt and 
Pharaoh changed his mind about letting the Israelites go and coming back. But my thought went to Adam. Adam was the first to blame. That woman you gave me tempted me. He's an, in effect, he's shifting the blame to God. Adam rationalizes just as we do this thinking. And, and Adam was thinking, I didn't even ask for a mate. That was God's idea. So God, it's your fault. No, no, no. We should never think this way. But we're quick to play, play that blame shifting game, aren't we? It's their fault. I couldn't help it. Everybody's doing it. It was just a mistake. Nobody's perfect. I was pressured into it. I didn't know it was wrong. Verses 14 and 15. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. Is Satan our only source of temptation? No. We have at least two enemies to fight. Satan for sure. But we must also deal with our fallen human nature. So you see, temptation leading to sin brings with our selfish desires, begins, excuse me, with our selfish desires when we are lured and enticed. Just as a fish is enticed away from its safety by the fisherman's bait in order to trap the fish with a deadly hook. Here it's the person's evil desire that ensnares, tempted by Satan. As 1 Peter 5 says, it is Satan who seeks to devour. The very source of temptation is a distrust in God. In this, of course, I'm, I'm talking about Temptations that we go the next step with. We're tempted virtually every day in today's world. Frequently, we're innocently scrolling through our favorite social media platform. And just out of nowhere, there pops an advertisement that we shouldn't see. If we stop and take the time, make the attempt to make sure that that ad doesn't pop up again, or we just quickly scroll by without taking a second look or a second thought, then friend, we have won that battle. The winning of small battles every day is when we win the war. Those small victories add up to winning, add up to victory. The distrust of God develops when we stop at temptation and pursue it further. The thought that God is withholding something from me that I deserve gives birth to sin. Sin is then manifested and brings forth death. I can't leave these verses without sharing something with you uh, from the book that the men are going over on Thursday night, um, Disciplines of a Godly Man. Um, as Dan James said, we meet Thursday nights at 8.30. Last week, we went over the chapter uh, entitled Discipline of Purity. And it talked about, of course, the sins of King David. This is a process that they lay out in this chapter 
that James Jones called last week in our home group, he called it the sin cycle. Now, I, I don't know whether um, this is in the ladies' book that they're covering called Disciplines of a Godly Woman. Uh, they meet Sunday afternoons at 4 o'clock. And by the way, that was an advertisement for biblical manhood and biblical womanhood again. Um, that is important. If you're not coming, you should be. But moving on. So w we all know the story of David and Bathsheba. We've heard it. We know it. But let's look at the, look at the story again from this sin cycle perspective. This story begins with David's life at the top. David was chosen by God to be king. David was brave. He was enthusiastic. He was confident. He had charisma. And under his leadership, all of Israel had been reunited. But David suffered from what can be called progressive desensitizing to sin. And that results in a loss of holiness. One of the first things that David did when he became king was to take more wives and concubines from Jerusalem. This Deuteronomy 17 had laid out that uh, the standards for the Hebrew kings and one of the things that it laid out was that they must refrain from taking many wives. David's sensual indulgence began the process of lulling him into a place that made him easy prey for deadly sin. Today, long hours of indiscriminate TV watching, video game playing, or internet surfing is a massive culprit to the desensitizing of people inside and outside of the church. The second flaw in David's conduct was his relaxation that included his moral life. If you'll remember in this passage, David was still on the top of his temple or, or his um, his house when all of his armies went out to war. Usually the kings went with their armies to war. But David had decided, I'm going to sit this one out. I'm going to stay home and relax. And when he did that, he let that relaxation bleed over into his moral life. David then fixated in this case, he was consumed with Bathsheba. However, that term fixation extends much further than just lustful desires. We can become fixated on a new car, a house, a boat, on and on. If it exists, we can become fixated on it. As our fixation grows, the reality of God fades until He disappears from our covetous eyes. After David fixated, then he rationalized. The mind is controlled by greed, envy, and lust and has an infinite capacity for rationalization. How can something I enjoy be so wrong? God wants me to be happy, doesn't he? My marriage was never God's will in the first place. David's fall from grace ends with degeneration from um, many things that included adultery, lying, murder, the degeneration of his family, and also national decline. Do you think David would have taken that first step 
if he could have seen the end result. Verses 16 and 17. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God's intentions for us are always good, and there is nothing in this world that is truly good that has any other origin than from above. God is unchanging, immutable in His character, and therefore in His giving of good. It's important to hang on to the truth which is that every good thing in our lives is an undeserved gift from God. In the middle of our trials, we could be tempted to mistrust God. Rather than doubting God, James is encouraging believers to remember that every good thing we have comes from God. He doesn't go from being a good God to a bad God when our trials begin. God is the source of light. At times, shadows may fall on us, but He is ever and always will be light. Turning away from God in order to escape hardship is as ridiculous as hiding from the sun in an effort to escape darkness. When we're faced with ordeals, we should seek the one who can make all things new. And verse 18, of His own will, He brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. First century Christians were the first generation to believe in Jesus Christ as Messiah. James called them a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The Jewish leaders would be well aware of the practice of offering the first crops to ripen just prior to the harvest as an act of worship and also as a blessing on the rest of the harvest. In 1 Corinthians in 50 verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 20, Paul refers to Christ as the first fruits of those who have died. James completes the thought of God being the giver of good gifts with an example of God's greatest good gift to us. God gave us new life in Christ. Look at the wording a little closer of this verse. This verse is amazing. The verse says, of his own will he brought us forth. Meaning, because he loved us, he offered us salvation. The verse says, by the word of truth, which is salvation through the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. The verse says that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We Christians are the first fruits, the pinnacle standing above the rest of everything else that he has made. What more evidence do we need that our God is good and loving and powerful and faithful to us? No matter how dark our circumstances in the moment, nothing can change the enormous good gift that God has given us in Christ. Worship team, y'all can uh, begin making your way this way. My friends, in the Christian life, there are trials and temptations. Successfully overcoming these adversities produces maturity and strong character. Don't resent troubles when they come. Pray for wisdom. God will supply all you need to face persecution or adversity. He will give you patience and strength in times of trial. And in our trials, God is not tempting us to sin. Rather, the difficulties in life are intended to strengthen and perfect us 
and make us more like Him. One of the greatest blessings associated with persevering through trials and proving our faith to be genuine is the confidence that hell will not have to be endured. Instead, there is the encouragement that comes from the word of Revelation 21.4 that says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. What does it mean to remain faithful in hard times? It means continuing to acknowledge that God is the source of what is good in our lives and what will be good in our future. Would you stand as we pray? Father, I thank you for this time to look in your word this morning. Father, I I pray that your word has made itself plain to to these people. Father, I, I pray that it has pointed to nothing but the glories of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that there's anyone here this morning that does not know you, that they would see that through the trials and temptations that we face, you are still good. Amen.